Uh, I'm going to go straight on, um, talk about what we've called the educator's role. We have put it in apostrophes because we're not talking um, about teaching necessarily, and that's quite important. So if I may start with Lisa Leydig from ICT Qatar. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. I appreciate this opportunity to share with you information about some of the exciting things that ICT Qatar is doing and planning to do in the, in the near future. I also am going to share a snapshot view of how young people here in Qatar are learning digital literacy. So first of all, what does uh, digital literacy mean? I think we've heard from many speakers today that it varies. There's no one all-encompassing definition. Depends on the, the situation. Depends on the country. So what does it mean to us, ICT Qatar? How does it shape our programs and our projects, our policies and our strategies? So we have three main drivers. The first is tech know-how. People need to know how to use the latest technologies that are on the marketplace. They need to use the phone to keep in touch with their friends, the computer to do their job well. Also, when they go home at night, they need to use the TV and the remote to relax from a long day of work. And secondly, they need tech skills. How do they make use of that information that's available on these high-speed networks and fancy devices. How do they create information? How do they manipulate it? And also, how do they keep safe online? How do they keep their children safe? How do they make sure people are not getting into their bank account when they purchase something online? How do they make sure that their children are not getting involved in situations that they're not ready for? And finally, they need to be tech savvy. So people need skills, they need digital literacy, e-skills, but they also need the confidence and the aptitude to keep on learning. So I asked a few of my friends here in Qatar who are teachers who are actually teaching ICT in schools to survey some young students and find out you know, how are they becoming digitally literate. So two teachers surveyed 50 students, ages five through eight. And the first question was, who taught you how to use a computer? And we found out that the students felt 57% of the responses, they said that their parents taught them how to use a computer. And I think a lot of you can relate to this. If you, if you have young, cho young children, they see you on the computer, they come and try to uh, pounce on the keyboard and try to find out what are you doing. They want to be part of, part of what you're doing. Interest, interesting also is that 28% said that they taught themselves how to use the computer. This is ages five through eight, feel that they are teaching themselves, which is very impressive. Next question was, who taught you how to use a cell phone or a PDA? Again, the answer was overwhelmingly that their parents taught them, or their friends, or a few said they taught themselves. Who taught you how to use the internet? Again, it was primarily the parents, but also a significant number of kids said that they're teaching themselves how to use the internet. And then we also ask them if they have taught anyone how to use any of these new digital media devices. And I think we've all experienced this, that yes, kids are also te teaching us something. They're teaching their grandparents or their parents or their siblings. I know that my own parents are becoming so adept with the help of their grandchildren that I recently got a request from my mother to join my Facebook. Not really where I want her, but she's already figured out that's where the action is. Then we asked them, where do they use the internet the most? 
and the majority of them said they use the internet at home. So that information isn't surprising when we consider the statistics that ICT Qatar gathered last year through its landscape report. So although the, the percentage of schools and homes is almost equal in terms of broadband connectivity, most of the PCs in schools are still not connected to the internet. So it makes sense that kids will be learning these skills at home where they have easy access uh, to the internet and PCs. So now I want to talk a little bit about ICT Qatar and what we are doing as an organization to support people and their development of these skills and also maintaining these skills so that everyone has an equal chance to participate in society. So we're looking at three key drivers. Technology, which is the connectivity to the networks as well as access to the tools. Making sure that the information is available that people can use and that they want. And then also helping people build that confidence to keep on, to keep on learning. So in terms of ICT infrastructure, ICT Qatar is working with the private sector and service providers to come up with a plan to help drive the rollout of high-speed, ultra-high-speed uh, internet, broadband throughout the country. We also already have initiatives currently in place to connect all government agencies, schools, and hospitals to specialized networks. And we have uh, wireless hotspots along the Corniche, and we're looking at other areas where the public can easily access high-speed internet services. We're working on models to help roll out and integrate ICTs in the school environment so that teachers can use ICTs for teaching, for learning, as well as administrators in schools use it to improve the overall operations. We're looking at making sure the tools are available and also that people take up these tools through awareness programs and showcasing People may not know how certain applications can be used in the home to help them with home financing. Or the private sector may not know, in some cases, especially the SMEs, how they could cut costs or improve efficiency. We're also trying to make sure that everyone, even those with special needs, have access to technologies that are suitable for them so that they can become equal members and participants in the information society. So information. So we know that people in Qatar love information. I've heard so, sort of secretively that 150% of the population, well, there's some mobile subscribers of 150% in this country, which may be one of the highest in the world. And that indicates that people have more than one mobile phone. They have more than one mobile subscription. Maybe they have subscriptions with two providers, since we have two providers. They might have a prepaid, they may have a contract, service. People like to communicate here in Qatar. So we know that people like information. So our role is to help make sure that information is usable and that people can access it easily and quickly. So we are looking at how we can improve the, the current government portal we have. It's called Ukumi, bringing on new services, making the formats easier so that people can uptake and use these services. We also have plans for an e-participation portal. People can express themselves and their views, share what they think about government and how they can address some of the issues that government is talking about. We also are thinking of incentives to get young people to create their own media, media which is indigenous to Qatar and to the Arab world and also ensuring that the information that is available online is accessible to everybody, including those with disabilities. And finally, we'd like to think that we can help people get that attitude and confidence to keep on learning and developing skills as needed. So looking at how can we build confidence 
through specific training programs designed for private sector, government health care, so that people who may already have skills continue to keep their skills up to date in ICTs and continue to be valuable members of the workforce. So we'd like to inspire trust in the population to make sure that they do use the internet so that giving them assurance that it is safe and secure, that their transactions will not be overtaken by criminals, people will not be getting into their bank accounts, as well as awareness issues on what they can do to keep themselves uh, safe online. We're also looking at, we have an e-learning e portal which is currently available for government workers. It offers over a thousand online courses addressing all types of skills, both individual and skills that are pertinent for the workforce. Thinking about how can we bring this out so that other groups of society can benefit from this learning tool. And finally, encouraging people to take risks, trying to develop a culture here in Qatar where local people develop or become innovators and ICT entrepreneurs. Thank you. I'd like now to hand on to um, Tessa Joles, who's President and CEO of the Centre for Media Literacy. Well, first, let me thank all of you for the warm welcome here. Certainly hearing the presentations, I feel that we all have a lot in common in terms of the kinds of issues we're addressing, the kinds of concerns we have, and also our passion in, in really helping to solve these problems. Not only do we have a lot in common, but as I've observed young people around the city here, uh, they have a lot in common as well. Uh, at the center, we often call teenagers screenagers because they spend so much time in front of the screen and they seem to have a lot more in common with each other than they even do with their parents at times. So we want to take a look at the formal education system here and the kinds of system that our children are going into every day. And I thought it might be useful to look at what that current system is. First of all, there's a value in the current system that access to information is scarce. And so it's based on the old print model where you had to get a book or you had to get face-to-face -face instruction. And we all know that those times have passed, but nevertheless, that is the way information is conveyed. And there's also an assumption in the present system that access to adults by children is plentiful. And so I know we heard some references this morning about how when children go home, you know, they're behind their device. And there aren't adults inside the device. But nevertheless, our system, our formal education system, assumes that adults are plentiful in children's life lives and that adults are providing screening and filtering for the kids in terms of getting information and making meaning from information. Also there's a value that content knowledge is something that's transmitted to children and not more interactivity. Subjects in schools are isolated disciplines, so there's math, there's science, there's history. There are all kinds of different subjects, but they work in isolation from each other. And finally, learning is contained. I mean, after all, that's what you go to school for, is to learn. Now, let's contrast that with digital systems and what they're based on. First of all, of course, we know access to information is plentiful. But access to adults is becoming more and more scarce. Children ages 8 to 18 are spending over six and a half hours a day with media, an average of 53 hours per week. 53 hours per week without adults. Adults supervising, filtering. We also know that in today's world, it's learning how to learn that's really important. So process skills, learning how to access, analyze, evaluate, create, 
participate with information is really the key to skill building. Also, in today's world, the disciplines really need to be integrated for problem solving. So I like to think of a teacher I know recently who gave her children a project of designing a parking lot for their school. And so the children needed to have geometry, they needed their mathematics, they needed communication skills to build their case and write a report for their school board. And so they were really tackling a specific problem from the point of view of many disciplines, integrating those disciplines toward the goal of solving the problem. And finally, in today's world, learning is universal. It's not contained. Uh, learning doesn't stop, and you saw from the survey that Lisa shared that much, much learning happens at home or certainly outside the classroom. Now, in navigating the global village, where do we want children to wind up? What's the end goal? I think it's important to start with the end goal in mind. We like to say that we want students to be efficient managers of information. We want them to be wise consumers. We want them to really understand how the consumer society works globally. We want them to be responsible producers. And we want them to be active and effective participants and citizens. And so Hessel referred this morning to critical thinking skills. Critical thinking is fundamental to all of these particular characteristics of the new global citizen. I apologize for my slides. They looked OK on my computer, but technology, so sorry about that. But anyway, um, OK, so how do we get there? How do we get this type of new global citizen? Well, first of all, we need to have appropriate curriculum and assessment systems. These systems need to be open to the world. We need our children to have access to the best teachers in the world. And with today's technology, that's very possible. Education needs to be more collaborative, more teamwork. And yet, because of the power of technology, in learning can be a lot more individualized so that children can proceed at their own pace. They don't have to be lockstep with each other uh, and just going at the pace of the group. Also, timely information is definitely possible to have in today's world. No longer are we bound by textbooks that take years to produce and that are outdated by the time that they come into the hands of our children. So this print-based world of education is definitely changing, needs to change, and can change even today. We need curriculum that's modular and interchangeable. Curriculum today doesn't have to be as linear as curriculum has been in the past because we have this wealth of information available to us. And so new ways of developing curriculum really need to be looked at. Assessments can be student involved. It doesn't all depend on the teacher because the teacher's role has really changed a lot. Uh, in that the teacher is more of a guide on how to acquire knowledge rather than being the person who just dumps data into someone else's head. Research validated frameworks are really a key to the new educational landscape because today we're really helping students learn how to sift information and again we're not into dumping information so we need frameworks to help us sift appropriately. And finally, we need curriculum that's measurable, that's scalable, that's tech friendly. And again, when you think about the way most education happens in the classroom today, uh, that really isn't true. Okay, what about the teacher, professional development? We can't really expect a teacher to be able to deliver this new kind of education unless they have experience with it themselves. So professional development is absolutely essential for success. In our work, we found that trained teachers can easily integrate process skills, these abilities to access, analyze, evaluate, create, um, into their different disciplines in as little as 20 minutes. 
But again, they need training to be able to make those connections and be able to provide that kind of lesson. And we've also shown that trained teachers who receive only six hours in face-to-face -face professional development were able to de deliver the curriculum and the lessons in a significantly more effective way. So in other words, their students were able to acquire the content knowledge in a much better way and faster way than the teachers who didn't have the training in how to de deliver the process skills to their students. Now, I mentioned about research-based frameworks earlier, and I, I do want to give you an example. But basically, we want children to learn how to ask the right questions. They're exposed to so much content every day, as we are. And so knowing which questions to ask is very important. We want them to think critically, but we also want them to have an internalized process for filtering information because we're not there all the time to be able to tell them this is right, that's wrong, this is accurate, that's not accurate. So we have to give them the tools that they can make those judgments for themselves. That framework needs to be applied to any kind of a media, any kind of message form. So it has to be kind of a universal way of sorting through. And it also has to help them explore their relationship with media and technology, understand the impact that, that media and technology has on their everyday lives, and finally be able to really problem solve using a framework. So the questions and the concepts that I've listed here are questions and concepts that are based in fundamental media literacy, media studies. And there are five core concepts, five key questions. So it gives the students and the teachers an easy entry point into learning about how to think critically with the media that they're exposed to. Uh, again, teachers are often called upon to teach critical thinking. But the question is how, and how can we do it easily? How can we do it today? We have to give the teachers the tools, and they need to be tools that are effective and that are grounded in research and in academic study. Uh, so these questions uh, are cross-curricular. They can apply to any subject. They form a common vocabulary for the students and teachers that can be carried and applied into any discipline. They're engaging for students because we found that students really like asking questions and really like to pursue answers. And also they're a tool for lifelong learning because once you've acquired an internalized process for thinking critically, you can carry that process with you no matter where you are, no matter what time of day, location, subject, etc. So just as a quick overview, uh, I'll give you the five key questions for deconstruction. We also have five key questions for construction that relate. Uh, the first question is, who created this message? So it looks at the idea of authorship. And I might add that Lynn Masterman, uh, out of Great Britain, is the person who originally came up with the concepts. And uh, he posited 18. And so over time, I think Canada has eight. And now in the United States, we're, we're using these five. Uh, the second question relates to format. What creative techniques are used to attract my attention? So really learning about the arts and how the arts are rhetorical devices to attract us to media messages. Uh, the idea of exploring audience. How might different people understand this message differently than me? Content. What values, lifestyles, and points of view are represented in or omitted from this message? And finally, purpose. Why is this message being sent? Understanding that all media has pur purpose, whether it's profit, whether it's power, whether it's influence. And so, again, we need to give our students a way of being able to consistently apply these questions to content, regardless of the subject of the content, and have a methodology for thinking critically about any media that they come across. So we have a lot of work to do in the world of formal education, as I'm sure you're aware. 
But I do believe that media literacy has gained more currency in recent years in education circles. I know I'm certainly hearing it a lot more at uh, the policy level, and I know that the European Commission recently adopted some guidelines for media literacy education, which is very encouraging. So we're at the beginning of this whole new journey about how to educate our children, but hopefully with the commitment and with the understanding of how this world has changed, we'll be able to do the job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I now hand over to Paolo Celot. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to have been invited to speak to you today. Very pleased also because over there it's very cold. I think that the air conditioning should be adjusted. I, I have worked many years in the, in the television field uh, and uh, doing different things and uh, this gave me an insight on uh, how the, the, the media, television in particular, uh, is working. I understood uh, why a program is transmit, why it is transmit uh, and produced in the way that, uh, that we see it. And uh, I have always been fascinated uh, also about uh, education. And when I saw that there was such a thing called media education, I thought that, uh, well, this is my, my professional uh, home. And I started to, to, to do these, uh, these uh, uh, things. I started to, to, to attend to conferences. And I noticed that there were two kinds of, uh, of uh, people that were attending those conferences. One were the academicians, the researcher, the, the professor in a broad term. They are uh, generally very, very rigorous. Uh, they, they, are, uh, they, they, they focus on, on the, the problem. Uh, they are uh, uh, rather than, uh, than on the solution, I, I would say. They, then there were other conferences in which media professionals were present. And the media professionals have uh, other, uh, other uh, issues to solve. Generally, they have to ask for a permission to attend the conference. They have uh, managing responsibilities. Uh, is, uh, the, the academicians, uh, they are not accountable to anyone, I would say. Is, uh, is, uh, and uh, this is not the case for, uh, for uh, media professionals. And, uh, the, the, the media, uh, the, 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 the people that I have encountered in, in the media uh, field, uh, uh, they usually uh, work for, uh, for companies. Uh, the, the, the aim of a company is to make profit. And uh, the, um, their priority is not legitimately public interest. Now, I work uh, for, I'm the Secretary General of EAVI, that is uh, a no-profit uh, civil society organization, and I, I, I like more to, to speak uh, about uh, citizens uh, rather than, uh, than uh, consumers, that is how the, the companies see their, uh, their clients. The, the, the condition of a citizen is much more satisfactory than, uh, than the one of the consumer. The consumer refer only to the market aspect, why, why citizens as a, a broad uh, is, uh, um, approach, uh, the social, cultural, and, uh, and uh, economical uh, aspects. Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here, because uh, these two worlds, uh, the education and, uh, and the media worlds, they are inextricably link each other. And uh, uh, the, you have, uh, you have uh, read uh, and uh, heard uh, uh, dozens of times that we are now in the information society, meaning that uh, the creation and diffusion of information is key is for, uh, for uh, uh, the, the, uh, the activity, economic, political, and cultural activities. Is that now, where is the information society? I think that before was called the information highway. The, I mean, it's a popular term. I think that it is quite uh, deceptive. Uh, and uh, I think that it should be, uh, we, are, we are rather in a media society with the omnipresence of, uh, of media. But the, the key issue is how to transform information into knowledge. And uh, um, 
it is clear that, uh, that media play a very important educational role. Uh, there are educators as well as, as uh, teachers and, uh, and uh, families and the other uh, social agents that we have seen before. Whether we like it or not, is that uh, the media can, uh, can uh, vehiculate uh, uh, values. They can uh, build, but they can also destroy knowledge. And in that respect, the role and the responsibility of governments is uh, in appointing or to control or to supervise, whichever is uh, the, the, the most diplomatic term to be used, uh, those that govern the media is, uh, is uh, a, a very fundamental one. And uh, obviously the role of media policy is, is a key in all of this. The, uh, information society has two terms. In fact, uh, the, the, one is, uh, is, uh, the first one is information, but the second one that is a bit neglected now is the society. Actually, whether we speak uh, about a government or an emirate, uh, is uh, uh, society is a way, in, is the manner by which is a group of people uh, uh, decide to live together, to share some, uh, some uh, values, to, to, to be organized uh, in, uh, in, uh, for, for a common aim. And uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to, to people. My, my point is that the society is made uh, of uh, people. The, I don't know whether you have read, uh, is, uh, the, the, there are quite a number of books that have been uh, present uh, is, is, uh, today. Is, is, uh, uh, Little Prince uh, is, is one of the best selling uh, uh, books uh, in, in history, I think. It's uh, the, is the story of, uh, of uh, uh, a little prince that, uh, that is coming from the space and is telling his story to the author of the book. And, uh, is at, uh, in, in one of, uh, of his journey, he, he, he tells uh, a, about a planet where, that he has visited where there was a king. And this king was very powerful, but uh, he had no citizens to govern upon. And uh, therefore, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, very, very sad. And uh, um, again, a, a kingdom without uh, citizens uh, is... Uh, is empty, and uh, uh, citizens are always the most important asset uh, for a country. And uh, the, I, I appreciate uh, uh, particularly the intervention, uh, the, the, the opening of intervention of uh, Dr. Hessel al Jaber this morning, uh, that they found uh, ample and, uh, and inspiring. Uh, the, I think that to improve uh, citizens' condition should be the aim and the mission of, uh, of a country. Now, within this context, and, uh, and I, in order to illustrate, uh, well, is in that case, uh, I will jump uh, to, to, uh, to my, I'm not going to speak about this, uh, is, uh, and I'm going to skip uh, a couple of, uh, of slides uh, is uh, um, this is a study that we have conducted uh, on behalf of the European Commission uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, we have delivered it uh, uh, one month ago. Is uh, what I want to to, to say about it. Uh, the, the entire study is uh, available on uh, on our website. Uh, is uh, um, and and in light of what we have heard uh, this morning uh, is uh, is the fact that the key issue of uh, the, the key uh, criteria that, uh, um, of which media literacy is about is critical understanding, is critical thinking. Is, and the second one is the, the, the participation, the engagement, the empowerment of citizens. That is to say that uh, if you look at the parameter, digital uh, literacy is just, a, I would say, a technocratic uh, uh, word to indicate the use and the access of technology, but it's not the, this is not the, the, the key. It's, uh, obviously, the availability of this media is a preliminary condition, but what we should focus on is to raise and to increase uh, the, the uh, thinking uh, capacity is, is of, of our uh, citizens, whether they are children or, or, or adults, this, uh, I, I think, uh, is the only uh, 
uh, way, uh, way forward uh, is I'm not very fond of uh, filtering uh, systems uh, that, uh, that have been uh, mentioned, I don't know whether at lunch or, or uh, during the conferences. Uh, in the longer term, uh, we need to have citizens that have built competencies that are good enough for them to, to, to understand what is good and what is bad, what is true and what is false, to, to discern between uh, propaganda and the information. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, well, I, I suggest, uh, as I suggested at the beginning, the crucial factor is uh, that the educational and the media world, uh, they, they, they come together to create a successful uh, uh, learning environment. And uh, it is only by in engaging with, with uh, the, the, the technologies that are available uh, that opportunities for learning possible purposes will produce uh, a, a good future. Now, is, I think that is uh, truly uh, true, true learning uh, with all the instruments that we have available actually is uh, inside and outside schools uh, that uh, uh, spreading knowledge and, and uh, wisdom and uh, values uh, is uh, that we can contribute to, to, to uh, a future bringing in the media and uh, that would be uh, good enough. I would focus on the opportunities and the positive aspects, although I, I'm very well aware of, of, the, of the need for, for, for protecting our children. Uh, there is, is to conclude, I, I want to say that uh, in history, is uh, the culture and civilization uh, as uh, travel uh, in, the, in the waters of, of uh, these, uh, these uh, seas. And I think that the this has brought to us both uh, conflicts and prosperities. And I think that uh, we have to work on, uh, on uh, education, on, uh, on uh, learning, on, uh, and invest on uh, our uh, citizens. Thank you very much. Go back to my call. Thank you very much, Paolo. And uh, you made an interesting distinction between information and knowledge, which maybe uh, some people would like to, to pick up on. I'd like to thank the panel for their presentations and for keeping to time. <laughs>